This is Profiles in Risk. Hosted by Nick Lamparelli. Every week, we interview those who risk life, limb, fortunes, career, and reputation, and those who work behind the scenes who look to protect and enlighten us about risk. You can find the show notes and other insurance-related content at insnerds.com. That's I-N-S-N-E-R-D-S dot com. Now, on to the show. Welcome to Profiles in Risk. I am your host, Nick Lamparelli. On this episode, I am pleased to introduce David Milton. David is the founder and CEO of Teleclaims. Teleclaims is transforming claims by using technology to reduce handling cycle times from 30 days to 30 minutes. David, how are you? I'm doing well, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I I hope I did your introduction justice. So I always start off all of these shows with uh, not my words, but your words in your words. What does Teleclaims do? We are uh, a technology company. Overarchingly, that's what we intend to be. Uh, But since we operate in the insurance space, we end up wearing sort of multiple hats, uh, both, uh, again, primarily as a technology company, but also as a claims servicing company. Then the easiest way to explain you know, what we do is uh, we have a technology platform that is designed to, as our tagline would suggest, ultimately reduce the claim cycle time. Um, so what we've done is we've created a platform uh, that's intended to be an ecosphere for all things claims. So all things claims and their processes. That ecosphere is intended and does include, certainly, first of all and foremost, the policyholder, uh, and then, of course, the adjuster, uh, any experts that are required to uh, opine on a particular claim. We do that in a secure video connection, um, and we can cycle in as many uh, experts as needed to ultimately bring the claim to resolution as quickly as possible. But, but that ecosphere is not just a peer-to-peer video connection. That is simply one of the components. We also have uh, the ability to dispatch vendors uh, in an Uber-like fashion, as well as amalgamating all of the readily available technology that exists online for any particular risk or particular claim and bringing that to the adjuster's fingertips so that he or she may make expeditious, informed, and accurate decisions. Again, the idea being that that's done quickly to, again, move the claim cycle along. Uh, We say often that no claim gets better with age, and adjusters need quality information in order to make quality decisions. So we think that we've created the technological platform uh, that will be used going forward to ultimately bring value to both sides, the policyholder and uh, the carrier. Who are your customers? Is it the insurance carriers themselves, third-party adjusters, independent adjusters? Uh, all. So okay. we, are, we are agnostic as to who our customer is. Um, ultimately, we are here to be of service to the policyholder. The way our model is set up, so in my previously described Uber model for vendors, the principal complaint of many of the vendors when working for insurance carriers is just the arduous task of getting paid for very simple, repetitious tasks. So we have undertaken that process. And so we ultimately actually pay the vendor first and then wait for reimbursement back from the carrier. So I I add that a bit of color just to say, so we're rarely hired by an IA firm, although we certainly work with IA firms, but ultimately because we have a fiduciary responsibility and and we have sort of money on the line, ultimately our clients end up being the insurance carriers. That was, sorry, a a longer winded answer than I'm sure. No, that's fine. That's fine. (laughs) Are there specific lines of business that teleclaims can handle, you know, 
uh, I'm thinking property lines or personal lines lines, but uh, could you give us an insight into, you know, um, the, the types of claims that the, the platform can handle? Sure. So we have set up with primarily a PNC uh, line to start um, and we have a scheduled rollout of uh, all other lines of business coming in from, uh, you know, obviously auto uh, and moving into to GL and, and, and workers comp. Um, but we fully intend to do heavy machinery, crop and hail. We'll, we'll do it all. But ultimately, we have a rollout process and we're starting in the, uh, the property line. So how did it get started? What was the problem that you saw? I, 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 tr I like to try to break these down into smaller pieces so that the listeners can understand you know, the common theme for how successful startups kind of get up and running. So let's start to that day where you decided, I'm, I'm going to do something. What was the problem you were trying to solve? So ultimately, um, in order to properly uh, answer that question, it's important to realize I'm 462 years old uh, <laughs> and began handling claims uh, from right off the Magna Carta. And so ultimately, um, years and years ago, the claims process was reasonably straightforward. It was reasonably streamlined. Um, the insurance companies empowered the adjusters. We were you know, well-trained, fully vetted, fully vested and vetted in the, the claims process um, and had some authority to go out and make decisions. So when we were doing that, um, we provided, in my opinion, excellent claims customer service and excellent customer service. I, again, I delineate between claims customer service and customer services are really two separate aspirations. So uh, again, seeing through the, the evolution of claims over the last 25 years, there have been layer upon layer upon layer of additional requests and requirements. And, um, and all of those things, in my opinion, seem to detract from the very simple process of, here's a claim, what information do I need to make an intelligent decision? Uh, and, and making that decision with some authority and having uh, all parties understand that process. So, so really, there was not a particular day. There was no eureka moment. It was um, seeing the process by which uh, the claims cycle kept getting longer and longer and longer. And so I, I tend to be a, a nerd and run a lot of actuarial math and, and charts and, and came clearly to the conclusion that claims uh, again, as I said earlier, do not get better with age. And so the sooner we can get to that initial uh, FNOL from, from the claim cycle, down, the better. So I just kept seeing this snowball, the claim process kept getting more arduous and more arduous. And so ultimately uh, it got to the point of, of needing to, to rethink the claims process, the workflow, and, and therefore the technology that would be used to, to effectively do that. I love history. So I think there's a lot of undocumented insurance history that most of us don't know. And I'm not a claims professional. We've had a few on the show, but I, I want to dig in before we move on. I want to dig into that just a little bit. You want to know about the boat ride from, uh, from <laughs> Europe over. I, I want to know about when you signed the Magna Carta. No, <laughs> uh, I want to know. So what went wrong it, just historically? Was it just the insurance executives just decided that there was adjustment expenses that we could that they could squeeze out? Not only the cost of the adjusters, but also hey, if we can just get the adjusters under control a little bit and you know shave five percent, ten percent from each claim that they adjust from the loss perspective, that goes right to our bottom line. Was um, it was it that or was it was it something was it something worse or, or the opposite? It just uh, you yeah, know catastrophes I, got I, bigger I, and it just got harder to do. Yeah, the answer to your questions is yes. <laughs> um, all of the above. All of the above. I, I you know certainly every insurance carrier, um, and and my background 
um, I moved on to to own and, and run a PNC carrier as its president. So I've seen this from all sides. So I, I'm not just claim centric, although I would certainly argue that's more my core competency. But it, it was well intended management. Every one of them coming in with a very simple: if we just had this piece of information, then we could make these decisions. And, and it'll only ask the adjuster to take an additional five minutes on this claim. And then the next carrier sees that and go, yeah, but if we only had this piece of information, uh, we could make these decisions. And so it was sort of this uh, eroding away of the efficiencies that were in the model of here's the claim, go handle it, to here's the claim, go handle it, and give us these few more pieces of information and these few more pieces of information. And well, there have been a few claims out of thousands and thousands that were handled that the adjuster made a poor decision in the field. So rather than view that as a training opportunity, let's pull back the authority from the adjuster. I need a better way to say, but let's dumb down the insurance uh, claims adjudication process and let's streamline it in a way that we can have, in my opinion, less qualified uh, easier to plug and play people into the process. And so it was not a sinister uh, evil villain sitting in this tower or sitting, up, sitting atop his gold, trying to effectuate uh, a 3% savings on LAE to the bottom line. In my opinion, it was a slow erosion. And with the advent of technology, every time a, technolo a technological advancement came along, the carriers thought, we need that without, in my opinion, stopping to ask the question, does it improve the claims process? Just because you can do it, does it mean that you need to do it? So I hope that, I hope that gives some color to my initial answer of, yes, it was all of the above. It does. It does. It, and so let's stay on the sinister side of things. Yes, sir. <laughs> Why... I think this would surprise people that are outside of insurance or new to it. You know, there from if you think of the sinister motive that the outside world thinks of insurance, they think, well, not paying the claim is a prime focus. Also, sure. delaying it is a prime focus. But you said at the beginning of the show that the longer the claim goes, the worse it is. I don't remember your exact words, but it's something to that effect. Why is yes. that? So, um, and you're right. I mean, no, no insurance professional could refute the public perception that uh, policyholders have, which is many insurance carriers have a philosophy of uh, delay, deny, don't pay, right? Um, and so they think that adds to their bottom line. I, again, let me clearly bifurcate most carriers from some carriers. So uh, to follow down your path of sinister, there are some carriers who, uh, in my experience, do have that philosophy. So let's not be Pollyannish in thinking that all insurance companies are completely well-intentioned. However, if you truly analyze the data pretty early on, and this really gets back to your earlier question of why start teleclaims? Because insurance companies with the experience that they have, uh, it is very easy for an insurance professional to subconsciously move to the idea that, all, that, that every claim coming in is fraudulent or potentially fraudulent and the insured must prove that it's not. And so they, they add on all of these layers of, you know, overly burdensome layers of almost the insured being forced to prove that they are filing a legitimate claim rather than uh, looking for and identifying red flags. And so it really just became this paradigm shift in some insurance companies that would slow the claim down to make sure that they've exhausted every possible means of, uh, of rooting out fraud, waste, and abuse. Let me be clear. We are very keen on rooting out fraud, waste, and abuse, but we believe that 
it's better to approach each claim as if it's being presented legitimately, move it forward until those signs present themselves rather than go in with a preconceived notion that they're going to present themselves. So, so it's a, it's that shift of, you know, who our policyholders are, um, the legitimacy of, of their claims at all, right? The, the entire group of claims um, and how you choose to handle those. So, uh, but if you look at the data, I'll sum up in, by saying, if you look at the data, no claim gets better with age. I mean, the, the, the hockey puck of uh, claims, not only the claims cost, the claims expense, the, the cost to handle the claim goes up, the uh, policyholders' expectations continue to go up and up and up as the, as the claim sort of drags on. And so that's why I say, you know, the data is, is white and black clear that uh, the quicker you jump in, gather all the information, the better off the claim can be handled. So I don't know if that roundabout yeah. answer answered. Well, your additionally, you then you, I think the longer the claim goes, the more likely you will have uh, potentially some kind of legal action or Absolutely. your regulator stepping in. And it, it reminds me of, uh, I think it was Katrina. One of the very large homeowners companies ended up paying like triple damages for, for some of the claim stuff that they pulled during that particular event. So it, it's, you know, it, it, we've said it a bunch of times between, uh, you know, Tony and Carly and myself and the claims people that we've had on. In my experience, it, when, it, you know, I deal predominantly in natural catastrophes, but in my experience, uh, we're there, the adjusters are told close the claims as quickly as possible. And if there's a gray area, side on the behalf of the policyholder. Absolutely. Close it, move on. That's exactly correct. But. Yeah. But the mechanism by which they effectuate that, that uh, goal is many times lacking. And if they only had a technological solution that could be brought to bear to actually effectuate that idealistic goal. I, okay. I don't know of anybody who has one, but if I could. No, let's, let's, talk, let's talk about that. So <laughs> without giving away trade secrets or anything like that, how, how do you speed up the claim? What's... What are, what are, uh, perhaps, perhaps it's easier if we talk about, you know, particular choke points, but you know, in a, in a claim cycle, how does teleclaims technology speed it up? How, how can you possibly get it to 30 minutes? Um, information. I, it's, it's really abundantly simple and, and I don't feel on the verge of releasing any trade secrets. Um, again, we believe that all of the adjusters that work for us and, and use our platform uh, understand that if they get better information faster, they can make better and, and more informed decisions to move a claim forward. So, um, I, you know, I've spent years training adjusters and have trained some, some adjusters that have come out to be phenomenally skilled at their job. The idea that I'm going to put my best trained asset in a car and drive him across town for three hours in rush hour traffic to look at a tub diverter valve claim that he's seen 452 other times is just highly inefficient. So we use the video, we connect with the homeowner, we understand what their loss is, and we can sit at our desktop and, and handle that entire claim. Two minutes after the FNOL comes in, we're determining if we need a plumber, we're determining if we need water mitigation, and we're ultimately getting that claim, um, the process of adjudication, not just the claims investigation piece, but the adjudication piece, and many times begins five minutes after the claim comes in. So uh, again, there's no magic sauce, there's no secret ingredient. I wish that I were, could claim that I were smart enough to have um, you know, discovered some you know, hidden process. I, we just have simply, and, and forgive me for being a, a little braggadocious about our platform, we just have a better mousetrap. I mean, we've just taken the pieces that you need to close a claim and assembled them in a seamlessly integrated workflow process that all parties buy into and see value in. So uh, how yeah. boring was that answer? I'm sorry. It, boring is good. 
Yeah, the, <laughs> the audience doesn't think it's boring for sure. Uh, does your platform include video? Yes, sir. That's its prime. Well, and, and so, so th that was really the, the origin of teleclaims, uh, you know, tele being the operative word in our, in our name. Um, it was intended to be a, a video, a peer to peer video connection. And that was sort of how it started. I mean, that was its first uh, functionality that we thought, you know, differentiated us from, uh, you know, many of the other platforms. And, and, and again, we are not, we are not a replacement for any claims management system, estimating system. We are agnostic as to what systems they're using. We simply sit on top and afford a workflow from those systems. Not, we're not intending to replace any carrier CMS or, or, or estimating software. We work uh, in harmony with those systems just to bring some efficiency. So yes, sir. So there is a video component. That was the central hub, if you will, early on. Now, our central hub uh, really has become our, our LMS, our learning management system, where we have, um, I think at last count, we've got 87, 88 videos um, and, and courses that are designed to take uh, a, a uh, millennial, uh, a well-educated, intelligent, charismatic millennial, uh, and walk them through the steps that they need to be able to go from um, whether, you know, high, high school diploma, college diploma, to adjusting claims in a very short cycle time with all those tools and skill sets that they need. So um, we've created a, a, so that really has become our hub and the video piece, the, uh, the vendor, the, uh, the asset management of the vendors and all of the information gathers in the field become in additional features, but not the principled uh, differentiator, if you will, in, in our system. Okay, so how about drones? Oh, absolutely. Drones, not just drones, but high drone. We're, we, we've, we've been playing with drones forever, and so we certainly integrate those. But we, we're actually playing with, um, I don't know if this is for the purposes of my platform or because I think they're cool, we'll say the former. The Hive drone, where we go in and release uh, you know, a dozen drones and they, they're uh, pre-programmed to not slam into each other and to try to go in and dimension um, a house in 3D CAD and the adjuster does nothing but open the box, the drones fly out and fly back in, and we've got a 3D rendering of, of the entire property. So, Well, that, that kind of brings me to, with all of this technology and what you just described, what's the future of the claims adjuster? I think some of them, if they don't keep up, will probably expire. You know, they'll kind of be selected out it, it just it seems like the the future of the claims adjuster is going to be very tech oriented I see I, I, I would disagree um, I, I, I certainly understand that vantage point and 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 again you you are right I mean you've got to be able to sit down and and operate you know a computer and a keyboard and a mouse but outside of that all adjusters today um, have been forced into that reality 10 years ago you know, there's nobody that's not doing that now. Um, our system is designed to take all of this technology, whether it's drones or hive drones or AI, you know, everybody gets all excited about AI and it's so misunderstood. You know, the artificial intelligence process is about taking a process that is reasonably predictable and repetitive and boiling that down to have machine learning handle that for you rather than you having to do that. So, um, you know, we use AI, integrated AI, to schedule our video calls. So uh, we get the FNOL, we put our AI bots on it, um, they, they arrange with the customer to say two o'clock on Tuesday is exactly when we wanna connect with, with a video call. So there's nothing that is scary um, in my opinion, about our technology, it's all integrated in a way that's very, very user friendly and is designed ultimately to drive the customer service experience to be uh, as, as painless and, and broad sweeping as possible. So 
Um, I, I, I appreciate your, your thoughts on that. I just think that if we did not do our job properly, there would be a high barrier to entry for technological aptitude. If we do our job well, um, as I said, anyone who can operate a, a, a laptop, a keyboard, and a mouse should be able to, to operate on our system. And in fact, um, we have uh, an unusual gap in our core users, uh, both the uh, seasoned um, and the millennial. And so um, the season- that, was, that was a very kind way of saying that. <laughs> well, okay. I'm in that group. I'm in that group. So I have to be, uh, I have to, I have to <laughs> monitor myself accordingly, right? Um, the, the, the seasoned adjuster is, is found new outlets in which to disseminate these years and years of information they have to a broad group of people that are, that are eager to learn. The young millennials are incredibly eager to learn and we just have a channel that uh, affords them to learn, we think, in a, in a pretty effortless way. Well, you, you are a tech company. So uh, yeah. as, aside from yourself, how many seasoned people are actually on your staff? What's the, what's the culture like at Teleclaims? Well, the culture is something we work really hard at around here. Um, I think we spend more time talking about culture than we do talking about our tech or or our insurance process or, or anything else. We are completely irreverent. We have uh, the worst possible distrust for the corporate environment that everybody associates with the insurance uh, marketplace. We work very, very hard to do things almost as polar opposite as the stereotypical cubicle, potted plant, wallpaper on the walls, uh, nine to five uh, insurance firm um, would be. Now, I, we think that, I, again, I, I wore a suit for many, many years, and quite frankly, I'm more comfortable in a suit than I am in jeans and tennis shoes, but, uh, but the people that we have here, both our tech team and our, and our adjuster team that we have here in-house, uh, you know, we wouldn't trade it for the world. So it's been a win-win, but we're going to have fun at work. So David, where do you see claims technologies? What's, what do you, uh, you mentioned AI, we talked about drones. What's coming around the corner that you get excited about that could, uh, I don't want to say revolutionize, but you know, we'll make, a, make an impact on claims adjusting. I think, it, you know, again, we're still very bullish on AI. I mean, we think there's a lot more that, that AI can do Again, it's going to not be light switchish. It's not going to go from off to on and and completely change claims. I, you know, we think a consistent work product, a quality consistent work product, is always going to have human capital as the driver of that claims process. So, you know, outside of satellite images getting higher resolution and and our ability to to uh, properly predict claims. The, the Internet of Things is really sort of where we are as a company uh, in, in on the forefront of what we're talking about so that ultimately, you know, we hope in the coming months, if a properly integrated house is on our system, well, policy would be to our insurance partners' uh, portfolio, um, as the, uh, the water meter goes off because there's been a consistent water flow for the last, uh, you know, 12 minutes uninterrupted and unabated stemming from the laundry room that is outside the norm. We, we see us being able to predict when there's a claim, not simply react to a claim. So we try to get closer and closer and closer to the trigger, the FNOL, um, and so we're, we're using the Internet of Things and all of the integrated devices in everyone's homes today um, as really the forefront of, of, our, of what we're looking at. Uh, yes, video will get better. Yes, um, I, you know, our vendor network will continue to grow and become enhanced. And the, uh, the Uber driver stopping by to take some video of your home is, become, is going to become much more ubiquitous, we believe. Uh, but ultimately, it's it's getting closer and closer to that F and OL that, that's uh, that's where we where we are technologically. I can't wait for the day where 
you can uh, get into a satellite via software, point it down at a lat long and kind of just beam around uh, with the same visual quality as a, as a drone. That'd be pretty awesome. It would be, it would be. And, the, and, and that, that data, I mean, well, I mean, I don't need to launch it off into the frustrations that, you know, the satellite resolution that we currently have available is certainly not the quality of the video of the satellite video that's available. It's the, sat, it's the quality of the video that we have access to. So. Sure. Sure. No, I, I'm, I'm talking when we all get access to NSA level right. satellite data. <laughs> <You> <laughs> that's what, that's what I'm talking about. You didn't get your NSA uh, sign-in credentials? <laughs> uh, that's, that's private. Um, <laughs> yes, sir. It, so it, so you, have, uh, you have young professionals on your team, and so I'm curious for the young professionals that are actually listening to this particular podcast, what would you recommend for someone uh, just sort of getting into adjusting or inter- interested in it uh, to kind of, you know, get a, get a good summary, get a, you know, get speeded up to, uh, to where they can be, you know, proficient or at least useful on claims. Yes, sir. Um, I, I, again, read, read, read. I mean, there, there are, there is a wealth of information that's uh, commonly uh, and easily available online, you know, various training courses. There are uh, a great number of courses that are, that are very, very good. Are there any, are there any that you recommend? Other than ours? <laughs> uh, do you, do you have a, do you have a training course? We do. I, again, let me, let me just put some clarity around that. I mean, we have our course, our LMS course of, uh, as I said, 80 some odd videos or whatever it may be, um, is intended to take uh, someone in off the street and get them from, um, I've heard of insurance, to adjust or proficient in an XYZ fashion. We do not have that held out as a uh, behind any sort of paywall. Uh, we believe in uh, spreading information and knowledge uh, as, as, as freely as we all uh, work to put it together. So, uh, so we don't have a, so again, longer winded answer to your question, we do not have a training system per se if you end up coming on to an onboarding with us uh, as one of our uh, available desk adjusters, then certainly we would look to put everyone through uh, our certification processes and and you're actually acquired, for lack of a better term, uh, to do our certification courses before we let you loose into the world of claims uh, for our clients. Okay, good to know. uh, is, Is any of that information on your website? No, we, we are uh, purposefully for the next uh, probably 30 days now, um, continuing to fly sort of under the radar. Okay. Purposefully. Uh, in about 30 days, all of that information is going to be on our website. Uh, we're going to have a, a grand uh, unveiling to the, to the broader marketplace. But okay. we've, been, we've been servicing a few of uh, our initial clients you know, covertly for, for several months now. And so we're getting ready to have our, our uh, debutante release. Well, perhaps we can tie in the release of this podcast. That would be great. To, to the timing of that. Okay. We'll talk offline. So, so, let, let, so let, let me reframe my answer then. Yes, sir. <laughs> Available on our website at teleclaims.com. There you go. There you go. Use whichever, we'll, we'll, we'll check together and see which one is, uh, which answer is at most applicable. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you've had a quote-unquote seasoned uh, professional career. Yes, sir. So uh, I'm. This is the we get into the personal part of the podcast. I'd like to know, you know, what books have influenced you? What books, uh, both professionally and personally, that you found were most influential in in your seasoned life? Well, outside the. Uh... 72 uh, carrier manifestos and manuals that I've read throughout the course of time that only come with the the seasoning. Certainly, I I would be remiss if I didn't pay homage to the CPCU courses. Um, I've taken a lot of those. uh, They're they're excellent sources to really delineate 
the the true claims professionals and people that are that are incredibly learned. So um, CPCU, but but getting into the to the modern world, certainly I read your book, Insuring Tomorrow, is an excellent uh, is an excellent read. Uh, we appreciate that. We understand the uh, the disconnect between millennials and the uh, the adjuster shortfall that's coming. We understand that uh, unless we find a creative way to uh, entice, incentivize, and demystify the insurance industry from being that of your uh, great grandfathers uh, or uh, the stoic industry that it has the reputation of being, we certainly believe that we're doomed for failure. So, uh, so your book is excellent. We put a lot of emphasis around here in customer service. All of our tech, all of our processes, all of our learning management, all of our everything is centered around the idea of customer service. Without that, uh, we believe you don't have much else. Uh, and so, you know, we do. We read a lot about customer service. You know, delivering happiness. Uh, the, the Zappos CEO book is an excellent read. Um, we love their business model of uh, of customer first. It doesn't always mean customer right, but uh, customer centric. Uh, approach and so uh, that, that's an excellent read as well too. Oh, I'll put those on the show notes and uh, yeah, I'm I'm not gonna pat ourselves for insuring tomorrow because that was uh, pretty much Carly and Tony's doing. I'm just I'm just going along for the ride on that. But you know, I've been dealing with uh, your employee Carlos, yes, sir. Uh, both in my email communication, but following him on LinkedIn. And I have to say. I think you're doing something positive on the culture because there's a very excited young professional who is the type of person that we like to see after, you know, they've come in, you know, he's now he's gung ho, he's excited. He knows what kind of contribution he's making positive impact, all of that stuff. So I, I think uh, I'll throw the credit back to you a little bit. You're doing, you. you, you must be doing something right to have someone uh, so excited about uh, working where he is. Uh, so f- my final question uh, would be, uh, I'm a nerd when it comes to productivity, mostly mm-hmm. because I'm so bad at it. So I'm trying mm-hmm. to study it and learn from the mistakes of others or from the successes. So what tools or techniques do you use to stay productive? Um, uh, Mountain Dew. <laughs> lots and lots and lots of Mountain Dew. I, I had one guest who said coffee. So, uh, yeah, I can, I can understand both of those. Um, no, I really, uh, the, the short answer to your question was a, was a phrase that I coined um, many, many years ago um, that is, as far as I know, it's an original quote, but it is, uh, without deadlines, there will be no progress. And so um, every task, every assignment, every, everything that we ask of um, any of our staff, uh, whether they be tech or, or insurance or support or anything it may be, we, we set, a, set aside deadlines. And so we hold people to those. Um, and, uh, and if you get there beforehand, great. If you, if you don't get there, uh, I'm not suggesting that, that we take you out back for lashes, but, uh, but we hold people accountable for uh, the timelines and the deadlines that uh, we set out. So, um, so we do a, a lot of, I, I don't want to come off as micromanagey or, or overly um, draconian. I just believe that um, to say this is what we want to do uh, everybody is is very quick to pick up that uh, sword and and run with it. Like yes, this is what we want to do. Getting that sword, you know, across the finish line. That was a poor analogy. Uh, <laughs> getting the baton across the finish line. There you go. Is something is something very very different, right? So um, so we do that, but then but then we couple that uh, around here in the office. We have uh, yoga instructors that come in on Tuesdays and Thursdays and. So we, uh, we believe in, uh, in unwinding just as much as we believe in winding up. So I like that. Next time you're in South Florida, we do uh, yogas on Tuesdays and Thursdays and judo on Mondays and, and Wednesdays. Wow. Um, because, listen, what, what good is it to 
have fun all day and, and go home stressed because, uh, so yeah, we, we try to marry mind and body. Yeah. I like that, that a lot. That sounded awfully Zen-ish and believe, it me, did, did, it, but, believe uh, me, it did. Believe me, you would, you must be here for yoga Tuesdays, uh, to really appreciate. We are not the, uh, the stereotypical legs crossed, uh, finding your, your inner peace. We have a lot of fun with it. So it's not, uh, it's not uh, quite as altruistic as that sounded. Well, as, as someone who is uh, pretty stressed out during the workday, uh, a routine of yoga and judo yep. seems like it would break up the day and relieve a lot of that stress. So I like that. That's uh, that's pretty good. Well, and some of and some of the people that work here are much better at judo than I am, so they really get a kick out of throwing me around all day. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I I bet they might take it a little too far occasionally as as often as they can <laughs> believe me uh david how can people reach you um uh, nick we're certainly available uh, through our website uh, at teleclaims.com that's t e l a c l a i m s.com there are any number of uh, contact us forms and any other way and uh, certainly on our linkedin uh, page uh, and any of the other social media, LinkedIn, Instagram, Pinterest, uh, you know, Facebook, you name them, we're on them. Okay. I'll make sure I link to those. My guest this week has been David Milton of Teleclaims. David, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to talk to us. Nick, what a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time.